So I'm Audrey Stewart. I'm the volunteer coordinator for Austin Waters Wildland Conservation Division. This is the final, the seventh and final webinar in our series, the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve Forest Restoration Training Series. A brief introduction to the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, or what we call the BCP, for those who aren't familiar. The BCP is a more than 32,000 acre um, system of preserves in West Austin that provides an umbrella of protection for two migratory neotropical songbirds. One is the endangered golden cheek warbler and the other is the um, recently, or like 2018, delisted uh, black cap vireo, still rare, and six endangered cave dwelling invertebrates, as well as 27 additional species of concern. Uh, multiple partners manage the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. It's a real collaborative effort. The two largest managers of the land are us, the city of Austin, and Travis County. Together we manage about 80 percent. Um, and so by mitigating for development of endangered species habitat, the BCP allows our region to grow and prosper in a way that protects our most sensitive species and our really great, valuable green infrastructure. We're going to share a couple of resources. So Lewis has really cultivated, um, and Lisa and Jim too, uh, a collection of resources to dive deeper after the presentation. They also include uh, some of these video demos that Lewis is going to talk about. Uh, and those are included in there too. So this doc, uh, Kate's going to add to the chat. It's called Google Doc with additional resources. So now, um, Luis San Miguel, uh, who's going to be our speaker tonight, is an amateur mycologist, entrepreneur, veteran, and IT professional who began working with fungi and plants when returning home from the Marines in 2013. Since then, he's gone through trial, error, and success growing fungi and decided to share his knowledge with the community. He started MycoBuddy LLC to empower and inspire the individual to develop a deeper connection with nature and acquire cultivation skills that can yield endless rewards. He'll be sharing his ideas, insights, and methods of working with fungi that he's learned from the world's leading mycologist and from direct experience. So with that, Lewis, thanks so much for coming and um, sharing the world of fungi with us. Uh, go ahead and take it away. So uh, hello, everyone. Everyone that's here um, online. Uh, thank you, you know, for taking the time out of your day and coming on to come check this class out. Uh, this is the last one in this series. And so um, what I wanted to do was bring everything together uh, with the help of fungi. And so uh, first, you know, thank you, uh, Jim, Lisa, Audrey, Kate, everybody, on all the presenters, if there's any other presenters that were here um, that taught in the other classes, you know, if you're here, you know, uh, just thank you for putting this all together and inviting me out here. Uh, this is just fun for me, and I, I like talking about this stuff. And so, I uh, hope after tonight um, that you'll, you know, kind of follow your curiosity and get excited about mycology and uh, go out and explore and stuff. And so, uh, and also hope you enjoy yourself tonight. So we're going to talk about because we're going to talk about some cool fun guy stuff. So, alrighty. So, one of the primary organisms. Uh, in the environment or fungi, you know, they manage a, a portion of the organic materials in a given area, and, you know, and they, they grow on a number of different substrates. Like right here, you can see these turkey tails are growing on the stump. Uh, there's some that grow on compost, leaf litter, uh, dead animals, and all kinds of things like that in different substrates. And they possess uh, chemical abilities that, um, that make it like a highly adaptable organism and one that's really cool to work with, right? There's a lot of stuff that you can do with it, and we'll talk about that more towards the end, when we, or towards the middle when we talk about the uh, cultivation process. And so uh, what we'll be talking about tonight is kind of like an overview of mycology, and we're gonna use that to our advantage to accomplish some of the restoration goals. Uh, you may already have some projects in mind, or you're just kind of looking to get started, or you've never even uh, heard about mycology and you're just getting into it. So this is going to be, it's going to touch on all areas of it. And so there's a little bit for everybody. Um, and not only does, you know, fungi connect everything in the soil, but it connects like so much more. And so um, one of the things I just felt the need to do was to kind of uh, connect pieces of the previous presentations and incorporate them into this one and kind of talk about how you know, fungi plays a role in all those different things. And so uh, let's uh, move right along. And the, um, the first thing that, you know, I'll be uh, talking about is organism itself. You know, it, it's, it's life cycle, it's behavior, 
Yeah, it's growth requirements and its ecological roles and you know the habitats that it can be found in. And then I'll move into the cultivation process. Um, we'll look at some of the cultivation methods, but it's going to be more of a high-level view of that and uh, the advantages of knowing how to cultivate and how it can help you know cut costs and also uh, make you more agile in uh, developing your restoration strategy. There's some cool stuff in there. And so we'll talk about that. And then uh, lastly, uh, we'll talk about uh, the fun stuff is like, how do we get, how do we work with fungi and how do we put it out there? You know, where do we install it? How do we do it? Uh, what kind of requirements it needs? What's, you know, and then the logistics of it, you know, the practical side of it and stuff. So, and then we'll, we'll finish up with some Q and A and uh, hopefully y'all can challenge me with some questions because I like doing that, I like staying on my toes. And so, alrighty, so the first thing, we're going to talk about is the fungal life cycle, right? Um, but I like starting out with this because once we understand the behavior, it helps us later on to uh, to apply it, right? We we know how what it's doing, uh, how it's working, and and what we're doing is we're harnessing the natural process, right? And so when we understand the natural process, uh, that'll help us, you know, uh, place it in the right area give it the right resources and you know hopefully place it in an area where uh, maintenance isn't so uh, intensive right and so um, the first thing we we'll start with is a spore it you know starts with spores and then those germinate into mycelium that's that's some fungal tissue then into fruiting which you see here are some turkey tails those are fruit bodies right those things are releasing spores and you know spore dispersal right and so this is what you know the the life cycle looks like you know generally there's there's a whole lot of different intermediary stages but uh but first we'll start with the major ones that are you know, pretty simple are the um the spores and so the spores those are you know there's a little um reproductive units and they're made of they're made of a casing of chitin and those are released by the mushrooms themselves and when the conditions are just right They'll, uh, they'll 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 germinate and then um, uh, tissue will emerge from that called hyphae, right? And that and once that emerges, that's when the all the cool stuff really starts happening, right? All the things that start happening in the soil, and uh, these travel by um, air, water, us, um, you know, animals, insects. When insects are eating old mushrooms that are laying around in the woods. Um, you know, th those things are getting dusted and they're just kind of making their way everywhere. And the fruit bodies release, you know, millions and millions of spores because the germination rates aren't always that high, right? And so when the conditions are just right, they'll germinate and you have these little filaments that come out that are made of chitin as well. Those start to branch out and connect and they start to develop a network. And that network is called mycelium. Right, you'll probably hear this quite a bit, and I'm I'm going to use this term quite a bit for the rest of the presentation. But one of the things to um, know is that mycelium is it's a dense it's a very dense network of fungal tissue, and in order for that network to expand, it does have to eat. So this picture right here has really really like this is beautiful mycelium. Um, I found this is uh, from some wood chips that was growing in. Uh, my garden and what's happening here is that this fungal tissue really at the, at the micro level it's excreting you know extracellular enzymes that can take apart organic matter there's different kinds of enzymes that they produce but they have to break down their food source into manageable sizes and then they absorb that through their cell walls and then they use those resources to um, grow more cell walls uh, use it in manufacturing other enzymes and other metabolites and things like that. And so as it's eating, it's also growing. And uh, the, the leading edge, right, like right at the tips is where it's also, it's, it's, it's digesting and it's also expanding. And so that's where the cell division is taking place, which is really interesting. Um, and in my studies and also like in the, in the high level, like mycologists and stuff like that, they really don't know how this is actually happening. Um, so, uh, those resources, you can dig into them and they talk about this. It's a really interesting process. 
Um, but for the most part, um, that's what's happening. It's, it's, it's breaking down its food, it's digesting it. And um, it also has to not only eat and break down its food, it also has to fend off you know, competitors, contaminants, pathogens, uh, predators and stuff like that. And so it'll uh, you know, create other enzymes, right? It's always like trying to, it's like a chemical factory manufacturing all these different uh, enzymes to you know, prevent infection and also you know, ward off you know, contaminants and stuff like that. And so um, that's something that um, the enzymatic process is really cool. And its adaptability is, is is really what makes it a really interesting species. And I'll talk about more uh, talk about uh, more in the the cultivation uh, portion of the class because there's some really cool stuff that we can do with that, right? And so it makes it highly adaptable um, in in many different environments. And you know, going off the behavior, uh, if y'all may have heard of Paul Stamets, uh, he's like one of the leading mycologists. Um, they they tested they tested this stuff to break down some contaminated soil with some oyster mushrooms and the mycelium was able to, you know, release certain enzymes, break apart that oil and also pre produce fruit bodies that were actually edible. Um, I wouldn't eat them, but I mean, he said they were good. So that yeah, was cool. But uh, afterwards, the, uh, the soil was cleaned up. It attracted insect birds. They dropped seeds and stuff like that. And the whole pile just became a little, uh, what do you call it, a little oasis of life. So it's really cool how you can use, um, use the mycelium. And so, and also these ideas are being, they're, they're being tested, you know, for proof of concept to use in remediation, uh, pulling heavy metals from the soils, also filtering water and things like that. But those, it's a little tricky to do that. So, and um, I'm not real experienced with the micro-remediation aspect of it, but uh, that's where citizen science comes in. And that's why we're here, you know, to learn about this stuff so we can dig into it. Um, and... Uh, if you remember in, in Jim's first talk, he mentioned the project with the ligustrum log, uh, logs that they, they inoculated with turkey tail. And, and that's cool because you can make use of an invasive species. And you know, turkey tail is a, is a white rot fungi. And that breaks down you know, the lignin and leaves behind the cellulose and uh, leaves the, the, the log nice and spongy. And I'm sure if you've been into the woods and you go and pick up logs, you can like some of them you can crumble and some of them you can't. Right, those are really good to, uh, you know, they'll, they'll retain moisture uh, quite well. And also uh, they're broken down enough so that way uh, the other microorganisms move in and they, bring the, they, they cycle all that stuff. And so it's very, 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 um, they're doing a lot of work out there, if anything, um, the, the mycelium. So this is the stuff we're gonna be talking about, mycelium is beautiful. So it smells so good too, it smells nice and sweet. Um, if you can smell it in the air, most likely there's some mushrooms around if you're out and about. So, and once it uh, gathers enough resources and the environmental conditions change, and it varies between species, season, and, uh, you know, uh, habitat, uh, they'll start to produce fruit bodies. And you can see here, uh, we have many different, you know, forms of uh, fungi. You know, you have reishi, uh, this little one right here with this, uh, this little buddy right there. I don't know what that is. It's so tiny, but I think it's cute. It's awesome has a little bit of like a mycelial skirt right here at the bottom. Um, and then you have some oysters here. These were growing in my garden. And then we have some uh, other polypores here that I found in the woods near my house. And so um, what, what the uh, fruit bodies are doing is they're, they're releasing the spores, right? That's that spore dispersal. And they're releasing millions of spores. So that way, you know, that cycle can continue. And they're releasing them either through the gills here on the left, or through their pores on the right or their teeth. There, there's so many different structures, but the primary function of the fruiting bodies or the mushrooms that we call, uh, call them is the spore dispersal, right? And, you know, right here, uh, you can see on top of the, on top of these, there's a little white dust. That's all the spores, right? That's just releasing the spores. And it also, um, you know, it becomes a food source for other, you know, organisms there. It's been chewed up by some, uh, probably some pill bugs and some other, uh, I have no idea what else is out there. But also, I just let that sporulate, uh, getting the spores in the environment, maybe it'll break down some of the wood there. Um, this I actually forgot about. I buried a production block and, you know, had some mushrooms pop up and I kind of forgot about them. They got huge and uh, so I just like to let them do their thing. Once, once they're like that, they're past their uh, prime uh, edibility, so I just kind of leave them. 
I don't want to be uh, risking things. So, and so once the spore dispersal happens, then the environmental conditions are just right. Then the cycle will continue again, 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 and again, and again. And it just continues to do that just endlessly, right? And so really, um, if we can control that process, you can kind of grow mushrooms forever. Well, at least, well, you know, as long as you're alive. So I like to, I like to mention that as a joke, but I mean, if you keep that cycle going, um, you know, you can always produce mushrooms, which is really cool. Uh, it's a great hobby, you know, to take up. And so, so that's the, uh, that's the life cycle, you know, at a glance, it's, you know, not, not too, too in depth, but, um, you know, you have your spores, they germinate, the mycelium grows. Mycelium is really what we work with. That's, that's, that's the good stuff right there. And then, you know, once it's, it's had its time or it just decides to, environmental conditions change, then it'll, you know, fruit and produce, you know, mushrooms or uh, shelf fungi, whatever it is, and it'll release its spores and that cycle continues, right? And so, so that's a life cycle. So now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move into fungal ecology. Now this is even more cool stuff. So uh, some of the things I'll cover, you know, the decomposition, you know, always out there breaking things down, uh, recycling stuff, re recycling the organic matter. They're also moving resources around through the network, which is pretty cool. And they play a big part in soil structure. And of course, uh, they're a delicious food source uh, for us and, you know, for other uh, foraging insects and animals. And also one of the, one of the coolest parts um, that I'll get into is, uh, you know, they connect, connecting the plant life, right? And so the, one of the, one of the main functions of the fungi is a decomposition process, right? The, you know, the organic matter is taken apart to its base elements. It, it's absorbed again through the, um, through the mycelium and also becomes available to the other, uh, the soil, soil microbes. And it, it's broken down to a certain extent, uh, meaning like uh, right here, we have a whole bunch of reishis. I found this in Tobin, uh, Tobin Hill here in San Antonio. These were growing on an old willow and it's, you know, it's, it's cycling through and it's breaking this down. And then after these fungi have moved through, then you're gonna have, uh, you know, secondary tertiary decomposers come through and then some microbes make termites, you know, coming through to start digesting all this and really recycling everything back into the environment, making the uh, nutrients bioavailable to the surrounding, you know, soil life and uh, habitat. So it's really cool about that decomposition process, right? They're just, you know, recycling everything like that. Uh, very important. Um, function, right? And it's a translocation of elements. Uh, this is kind of, it, when they're breaking stuff down, you know, if, if you look here, uh, this is a fallen elm that, um, elm or pecan, I can't remember, kind of looks like a, no, it looks like an elm, uh, that fell down here at Southside Lines Park. And it was a pretty big tree. I'm saying a good, you know, 20, 25 foot tree that fell over. And you can see it's covered in uh, fungi. This is a Schizophyllum commune. It's a fairly common um, uh, mushroom here, and the mycelium is inside of here. And if you look all the way down to the end, an entire network is running through this log, and so it's it's transferring nutrients throughout this log, and it's also breaking it down. And the same thing is happening uh, in the soil, right? And so uh, it's breaking everything down. And you know, if the tissue were to die in the soil, all those nutrients would then be you know, those will be redistributed into the soil uh, once the tissue is degraded and consumed by other soil microbes, worms, and things like that, right? So they move, they move stuff around. These networks can be pretty vast and pretty big. Uh, and that's something, you know, we'll talk about a bit later when, uh, when we come to the mycorrhizal fungi. And soil structure. Um, in this instance, we're talking more about, you know, like the my mycorrhizal networks, you know, why the mycelium's growing, uh, it's breaking things down, but it's also releasing uh, glycoproteins called glomalins, and these bind the soil particles and they create aggregates. And as the aggregates get, you know, uh, bind together, they start to create, you know, pores in the soil, and it creates channels and pockets for air and water and other microbes to move in. Uh, one of the cool things is that the, the mycelial networks, they can penetrate and get into those nice little tiny crevices that actual, you know, feeder roots and stuff, they just can't penetrate because they're just, they're just too bulky, right? And these are real fine. And if you can look over here on the right, um, this is all just, it's just holding the soil together. This was a, this was from a compost and then just an installation. 
uh, it's really tough stuff. It's, it's really nice and it smells good too. And so, um, again, you know, if this stuff, you know, break, as this stuff breaks down, you can see these nice, uh, uh, thick networks that look like roots, you know, as those, uh, if they were to die uh, and dry out, the channel would be left behind, you know, as well for the soil, uh, for the water and the air to penetrate and move through. And if, um, you know, uh, Lisa and Jim talked talked about this quite a bit again. So this is kind of like, you know, if anything, it's a review of what's going on with the uh, fungi underground, right? And so uh, they're great for, you know, cre uh, erosion control. That's one of the, you know, those um, emergent properties and also uh, carbon sequestration. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we move to the mycorrhizal fungi. And, you know, so real great for soil structure and food source this is like you know our favorite you know we, we like mushrooms we want to see mushrooms we want to grow them right and so what's really cool about them um is that you know they can be grown on a, many different substrates they can be grown on straw cardboard uh wood chips um you know corn husks pecan holes like if you, anything organic you pretty much can be grown on it. especially the oyster complex the oyster mushrooms are excuse me they can be grown on a, like over 200 different substrates are highly adaptable, which is a good, uh, I'd say a beginner mushroom to start cultivating. So whenever I teach my cultivation classes, I do, uh, I use oyster mushrooms because they're kind of foolproof. Um, they're going to grow and um, they're pretty cool and they look amazing and they're delicious as well. Um, so um, nutrients, they got a lot of uh, trace minerals, a good source of trace minerals, right? And protein, you know, they lack a couple things, you know, fat, uh, cholesterol, you know, so they at least are good in that sense. And uh, they have, you know, uh, triterpenes, glycoprotein, antibiotics. Uh, you know, they do have their medicinal qualities. Uh, I'm not going to really get into that tonight, but uh, we've all, we all know, you know, the reishi, turkey tail, lion's mane, uh, shiitake. Those, um, if you go and dig more into the research, and also uh, when the resources, um, those are more of the common uh, mushrooms that you know you're used for the medicinal properties, and I'm sure some of y'all familiar with them because they're starting to really. Uh, I don't know, I'd say fruit in, in, in the, the wider scheme of you know, society, people are starting to be aware of mushrooms, which is why everyone's here, right? We're learning about fungi, it's really cool. So um, uh, I, I, these are awesome, um, they're great. Um, they're not only food for us, but they come, become food for you know, the, the organisms that are out and about. And uh, one of the cool things is, you know, like say this uh, pill bug right here, it's eating, you know, some of the oyster mushroom, and it's also getting dusted with spores, right? And it's eating, and they'll survive the digestive process as well, um, which is why um, they've been known to grow on dung. But yeah, they get dusted with spores. They go about their life, and they're basically uh, transporting the spores somewhere. If they dig into, they burrow into the soil, those spores can, you know, <clears throat> be uh, be left behind on some organic matter, and they may germinate, and the cycle will continue. Right, so food source not only for us but also for everyone else. So it's always good to share your your harvest with the surrounding uh, uh, plant life and also the insect and wildlife. You know they're going to spread the spores too. So they they like to help out in the restoration process as well. Right, they do they do a lot of work and you don't even got to pay them. So that's pretty cool. All right, and so another thing, well, really one of the coolest things is uh, connecting plant life. Um, um and then <clears throat> excuse me and that the, the, the way they connect everything you know really uh, lends to uh the vitality of the ecosystem right and then and that's where we're going to move into uh, some of the categories of fungi right and so the first one you know i'll talk about is the mutualistic fungi and there's a better known than the mycorrhizae uh, you may be familiar with these as well because uh, jim and lisa again they talked about in some detail in the in gym soil class and in uh, Lisa's tree planting presentation, right? Talking about the, the wood wide web, I think it was called. So uh, yeah, they're doing a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff. And a really good book to learn about these is what the book where I started was uh, Teaming with Fungi by uh, Jeff uh, Lowenfels. It's a really good book, not too hard of a, uh, of a read. And um, it's just so fascinating. It's, there's just so much that that Michael Rizal um, is doing and so you know according to Jeff you know you have the our bus, our muscular mycorrhizae that attach to the plants by you know penetrating the root the, the cell walls of the roots 
and then you have the ectomycorrhizal, which attaches itself to the plant roots and it forms a mantle on the outside and it penetrates um, between the cortex. So it doesn't actually make it into the cell. So there's all these little nuances with the names and what they do. But the, uh, the one thing to remember is that they do, they partner with, they partner with plants, they partner with trees, and um, they, you know, is over, they partner with over like 90% of all plant life everywhere. And so they're, they're under the ground, you know, for sure. Um, and they just may not be producing mushrooms, uh, but it's always good to um, find some beautiful mushrooms like these uh, chanterelles here. This is a mycorrhizal species as well, ectomycorrhizal. And um, what's really cool about them is that, you know, they act as an extension of the root system and they allow the, the plant partner to source more water, nutrients, and trace minerals. And one of them being phosphorus, which is really important, right, in, in ATP production. And this is locked up in the soil and sometimes it's difficult for the plants to get to it. And, uh, and the fungi has the enzymatic process, you know, and they can adapt and they can break down, they can weather rock too, so they can access the minerals and rocks. Uh, plants have a really hard time doing that. And in exchange for this, the, you know, the plant supplies the mycelium with carbon and other resources, which moves into the, the carbon sequestration. So as the tree pulls carbon from the air, it exchanges it with the fungi because the fungi is doing its thing helping out the plant and so a lot of the um, a lot of the carbon will be basically stored up in the mycelial network and these these networks can uh, they can ring they can grow for acres and they could connect whole uh, entire acres and acres of trees and uh, you know they share nutrients between each other they help out the saplings and um, you know uh, this is more of a this kind of a hypothesis that I thought of uh, when I found these right here, these uh, chanterelles, um, I found these in San Antonio. So if anybody is here from San Antonio, I find these at McAllister Park. Not gonna tell you exactly where, but you'll probably find some because I ended up finding them quite, uh, quite uh, on, in a lot of places, you know, over the, over the park. But um, so I'll go back to the hypothesis is um, if you have, so you find some chanterelles, right? And, they they prefer they like to partner with oaks and they can they can partner with other trees but they primarily partner with oaks. If you find them there, um, one thing you can do is to dig up the saplings that are in the area and there's probably a good chance that you'll dig up a part of the network and then you can transplant that, uh, grow that out and tend to it to you know try to help that um, try to help that that network grow right. So that way you can have some chanterelles because those are delicious and it helps out the plant or it helps out the tree. Uh, the soil it's just all around awesome they're just they're just so cool sorry yeah i just i just thought just like talking about them and uh, uh bragging about them they're pretty awesome and uh not all of them produce mushrooms some do and um for the most part they sporulate underground uh the network they'll they'll create little uh nodules they'll, they'll release spores underground but sometimes they come above ground uh like this and so you can take spore prints from these i've taken a few spore prints from these chanterelles and uh, I'm just going to do a little experiment and, and see if I can get them to grow on some seedlings. Uh, I don't know. Um, something to note. I'll, I'll talk about a little bit um, in our um, in the the introduction part, uh, in, intro, uh, installation part. Sorry, of uh, the methods to use the fungi. Definitely um, inoculating with mycorrhizal is one of them. And so uh, you know, having these. Uh, these species, right, uh, introducing these mycorrhizal species, um, they improve, you know, the plant diversity, they accelerate the succession, and the establishments of plants, you know, to restore the communities and stuff like that. And that's coming from this, this Corzo from University of Kansas. There's a link in there. I, I think I need to send that one out. That, that one I found um, fairly recently. So, so that's how they, they connect plant life. You know, it, that's the coolest part. Uh, you want to get a little bit more into it um, you know uh, Jim talked about it quite a bit Lisa again you know check out their talks and um, you know see see what they got to say about that because those are they're they're very important you know they did you can't ignore them you know and we shouldn't they're pretty cool so so that's the mutualistic fungi right those are the ones that partner with plants and you know these are again these are chanterelles um, ectomycorrhizal these are delicious they do maybe you smell pretty good and uh, there's some lookalikes, so if you're not uh, familiar with uh, these, you know, be very, very careful. And also, again, disclaimer, please do not anything you have not identified properly. Um, 
you can get very sick. So um, I'm waiving all liability. So, you know, don't, don't go out there and say, I told you to, but uh, they're so pretty and yeah, they do look delicious. So, um, so now we're gonna move on to the uh, saprophytic fungi. And the, this is a category that composes of the primary, secondary, and tertiary decomposers, right? And right here, this is a turkey tail, right? We know turkey tail, it's, a, it's fairly common. Um, and, you know, uh, it's a white rot fungi. So, you know, it digests uh, lignin. And also, uh, it, it's pretty common. It grows on fallen stumps, trees. This one you can find, you know, pretty much everywhere. And it's, uh, it grows all over the place. And um, it's, it's highly medicinal. Um, so the uh, fungal pharmacy is one of the resources. I encourage you to check check that out. And also mycelium running, Paul Stamets talks quite a bit about the medicinal properties of all these mushrooms. And um, they're just fairly common and they're a good species to work with. Um, they're kind of a foolproof when it comes to using them for installations because they do take to many different substrates. And, um, and also it's mycelium is very, very tough. So if you're growing it out, you want to be careful not to over, um, over colonize this stuff because then you won't be able to break it apart. But there's companies like uh, Microworks and I believe Ecovative. They're making, uh, they're using it to make mushroom leather, uh, packing materials, you know, so kind of pulling away from the styrofoam, uh, you know, so that way you can have packing materials that you can just throw out in the compost and all those nutrients are there. They're breaking apart that material and you can feed your, feed your garden with, uh, with some materials from your TV or something like that. It's really cool. So, um, and again, highly medicinal. And it's a white rot fungi. And here is a, here's a little list of brown and uh, white rot fungi. And this is from uh, Peter McCoy's Radical Mycology. Now that book, I highly recommend that book, but it's a really thick read. It's kind of, it's, I recommend that one because it kind of has everything in it. So it's a real good, uh, real good book. Uh, so the brown rot, those are the ones that digest the cellulose. Um, so these brown rot, you have uh, Letiporus sulfurus. Sulfuricus. This is a chicken of the woods. Some of y'all may have found this before. This is a delicious mushroom. It actually does taste like chicken. Um, and uh, this one grows, uh, I believe, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I'll answer a question. I know uh, Lisa asked me uh, to cover if the, the fungi was, you know, parasizing the tree or was it growing on the tree and infecting the tree. Um, sometimes the, uh, especially for like the, um, uh, the chicken of the woods, that's more of a secondary decomposer. So that one you'll usually found, you'll find that growing inside of the donut from a, a pruned tree. Uh, so whenever the tree consolidates itself, there's that heartwood that kind of sticks out and it just turns black. That's usually where you'll find uh, chicken of the woods popping out because it's actually growing on the dead part of the tree and it's not actually growing on the tree itself, right? And we'll talk about some other uh, parasitic fungi here in a bit. Um, but yeah, that's something to, and again, these, uh, these categories are kind of based on their behavior, but when push comes to shove, you know, the fungi, they have been known to change it up and infect things in more of a parasitic kind of way, uh, as opposed to a saprophytic kind of way. So um, they're really adaptable. So uh, Ganoderma, you know, Rishi is one of them, but it's kind of like, uh, people go back and forth about it that if it's infecting or it's not it's just sometimes they move in when the the immune system of the tree is compromised for whatever reason and they'll go ahead and come in maybe because the mushrooms know it's the tree's had its time um not too sure but um it, it kind of varies so there's no real way to kind of it's not real cut and dry when it comes to that but there are uh, parasitic fungi and we'll talk about those in a minute and uh white rot you know uh ganoderma reishi mushroom uh, Rifola fondosa, maitake, Erisin erinaceus, that's the lion's mane, the most delicious mushroom. I highly recommend uh, trying to pick that up from somewhere. Then you got the oyster mushrooms, the, the Pleurotus com complex, and then Schizophyllum commune. We saw that one earlier growing on that big tree, right? These are, these are the first ones to move in and they start that decomposition process and they make way for all the secondary and tertiary decomposers that come on through. So that's the saprophytes. So now we'll talk a little bit about the parasitic fungi. Um, these are always cool to talk about, at least the, uh, the ones that grow on the insects, not the ones that grow inside us or uh, wipe out our tree populations. 
Um, but you're probably familiar with like powdery mildew, you know, you find those on creek myrtles. Um, sometimes that's because of too much moisture and, you know, so those imbalances, you know, kind of bring on these uh, uh, fungal infections. You know, you got vascular wilt, you know, oak wilt. That one's not very, uh, not very kind. You know, we, we, that one's really, really tough to deal with. And, uh, and sometimes we have to contend with them ourselves inside our bodies when our, 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 uh, our gut flora, you know, becomes imbalanced, right? The, the, the fungi can kind of, you know, you know, get out of control. So it's always good to have a, you know, balance uh, with that. And so we do have to deal with that, you know, even as humans, right? And some of the cool ones, uh, you know, everyone likes talking about these is the entomopathogenic fungi. And those are the ones that, you know, infect insects. And I'm sure some of y'all have seen like the ants, uh, the zombie ants, people write articles, you know, it's a zombified ants and people are, you know, make comments or like, haven't you seen the movie, this and that? Like, um, so it's cool because, um, at least, uh, you know, the spores, you know, it's just, they, they spore, they just like the other fungi, except these spores, when they germinate, that mycelium has the, the ability to manufacture enzymes to penetrate the exoskeleton of living, uh, living insects. And also, you know, some of their larval stage, like you see, that you can see here. And once it does that, it grows inside the tissue. And then at eventually, at some point, uh, eventually it just digests the, the insect from the inside. Um, it'll usually control it to, um, you know, lock its mandibles in an ideal condition or ideal spot to where it'll produce a fruit body and that fruit body can disperse spores in, a, in an ideal situation to where they can, you know, uh, digest, or I'm sorry, sporulate, you know, at a wider range. Um, quick little story from um, a talk I, I went to with uh, Trad Cotter. Um, you know, they, they studied this with ants, and one of the crazy things was that the ants that became infected, they would, you know, uh, the, the fungi would control the ants, it would sense out the pheromones, their little pheromone trail that the ants leave, and the ant would then, or the fungi would control the ant to place itself and lock its mandibles in an area directly above that pheromone trail, so when it produced the fruit body, and it's sporulated, it basically will just sporulate everybody passing by. And that's just really, really interesting that the uh, fungi does that and has the ability, you know, to control the, the insect in that way. Um, another thing that's really interesting was about the, uh, uh, there's kind of, there's guard ants that guard the colony and, you know, they're kind of like the bouncers and stuff. And they can, sm they can sense when um, other ants have been infected with spores. And so what they'll do is they'll, take them out to pasture, so to speak, they'll, they'll take them and they'll, they'll take them out um, far away from the, from the colony and they'll dismember them and they'll bury them so that way they don't infect the, uh, infect the colony. And then the guard ants will then bury themselves because they've become exposed. And so, you know, they sacrifice themselves for the greater good. I thought that was a really cool story. Um, you may be able to pick that one up in a Trad Cotter, one of Trad Cotter's talks and uh, his book is in the resources as well. That's a good book to start with too. Um, it's got technical re uh, reading and then also just some, some pretty uh, straightforward uh, cultivation stuff to get started. So definitely check that one out. So parasitic fungi, uh, this one's Cordyceps militaris. This one's uh, been known, it's uh, getting pretty popular with its uh, you know, medicinal qualities. And um, I highly recommend take, taking a look at that one. This is pretty interesting. And these have also been used um, Again, Paul Stamets, he, he talks about this. They've been used as mycopesticides, right? They've been able to uh, culture them to where they don't produce spores and they don't wipe everything out. Uh, so they can use target species, right? They can target certain things. And I thought that was really interesting. So, so that's parasitic fungi. Uh, now I'm going to move into the cultivation aspect of it, right? So we talked about, you know, it's life cycle, how the mycelium, you know, acts and, you know, what it's doing. And then, and, and it produces its fruit bodies and it sporulates and now the life cycle works and then how all those uh, emergent properties are moving around and uh, shaking, moving and shaking in the environment, you know, moving, moving the elements around, uh, breaking down the organic matter and all that good stuff, connecting the plant life, you know, that's the uh, nature's internet. So they, the plants and everybody likes to get plugged into that. But now, since we, now that we understand that, then what we do is we channel that process, right? And so, um, so I'll talk about a little bit about cultivation and 
the goal, the goal as a cultivator is to grow out mycelium successfully. You know, we do this again by channeling that natural process uh, in a controlled manner. So that way the mycelium can grow without, um, without disruption from competitors or contaminants, right? And so we take the mycelium and we introduce it uh, to a substrate that's been prepared either by sterilization or pasteurization. So that way they get the competitive advantage, right? And then we continue to expand it um, on bigger and more bulk uh, substrates, right? And so uh, possessing the skills to cultivate can really, really help your restoration efforts, uh, not only from a cost, but you can experiment with different things. Uh, one of the, the cool things about it is, uh, and this is something that I do, is, uh, and actually I did that um, at the, um, the, the, the volunteer station over there uh, at the Wild Basin. Um, Lisa and Jen, they showed me their installation where they, um, they inoculated their tur the legustrum logs with turkey tail. And I took the, those uh, turkey tails, I took them home with me and I cultured them up. And so I have a copy of those turkey tails that have learned how to break down the, uh, the legustrum. Right, this is something, uh, something I'll get into. Um, if you remember, you know, the, the, adapt, the mycelium's adaptability when it came to producing enzymes, um, this is where you can like train your fungi, right? You can, you can introduce new food sources and the mycelium will have to figure out, you know, how to break that down. And it eventually, um, it does take some time. Sometimes it's, you want to slowly incrementally introduce, you know, a different wood type, uh, maybe a different contaminant. Uh, things like that, and eventually the, the, the mycelium will adjust. It may or may not, but more than likely, especially if it's like wood or it's a uh, organic matter, it'll figure out a way to create enzymes to start to take that apart, right? And so this is pretty awesome because then you can train it to like the the turkey tail that they use in the legustrums. That turkey tail now has the ability to break down the legustrum logs, right? And so uh, in the event, another advantage is you can preserve species, right? Um, if you know, say there's an area that you know has been slated for development and you know it's impending that it's gonna get wiped out, uh, you can go in and you know collect some fungi, uh, collect some species, and you can culture them up. And you know this is kind of where uh, m the IT part of my brain comes in, is where basically you're backing up uh, genetic information, right? You're, you're, you're backing the cultures up in a library and you're preserving them and you can use them and you can expand them. And so uh, one thing that, you know, I like to keep in mind is that if you're going to use this, uh, you're going to use mushrooms or fungi as uh, in your restoration strategy, a good thing to do is to go out and find fungi that's already growing there, that's already adapted to the conditions, uh, the weather, uh, the, the competitors and stuff like that out there. Those are the really tough fungi as opposed to the uh, pure cultures that you can get from like commercial cultures that are used specifically just for producing higher yields for consumption. Um, these are wild fungi and that's the advantage to being able to cultivate. You can, take, you can take those species, you can replicate them and you can isolate them and you can expand that material and really you know, get them back. Say the population is dying out. Uh, we've done a survey, you can reintroduce them and like kind of help them out in that sense. So it's really cool. Um, and again, you can, um, you know, you can uh, produce mushrooms kind of forever. And so um, one of the things, um, you know, I, I remember in uh, Daryl Hutchison's talk when he was talking about invasive species, that's it right there. Go uh, see what invasive species you have and see if you can train them, you know, to take apart that invasive material, right? And then you can use that and you can inoculate and, you know, take apart you know, different, different areas of the site that, you know, is like really heavily, um, heavily, you know, invaded or whatnot. You have materials on site and you have a fungi that can break that down a little bit more of a ease. So I don't know if uh, Daryl's watching, but I mean, maybe that can be a, a, a micro control, oh, maybe a, a bio control, but maybe a micro control for, you know, invasive species. So, um, so cultivation, you know, cultivation is really cool here. You know, we, we get, we isolate the mycelium, we get it on a plate, we throw it on grains, uh, the grains, you know, uh, high, you know, nutrient source, and we get those growing out, and then we expand those, 
onto a, a more bulk substrate, usually sawdust. And here on the left is a bag of a fully colonized block of sawdust, uh, nutrified sawdust. And you know that's where the fork and the fork in the road comes in because you can use that and you can expand that out. You can use that and you can inoculate beds, you can inoculate logs, or you can cut it open and get these uh, beautiful pink oyster mushrooms here. I like to you know kind of show off how beautiful they are. But yeah, you can all, you can inoculate and you can have these mushrooms growing out at your site. So really cool stuff. So you know, cultivating cultivating is pretty cool. You know, it's all, even the the learn the fundamentals and from there you can get all you can really get in uh, get deep into it. So it's pretty fun. So so now uh, so that's the cultivation part. Now we're going to move into how you know to approach uh, restoration. And um, since now we, we understand our, you know, our fungal allies and you know, we can kind of, we can, we can control them and we can put them in certain spots. Now is the, uh, you know, we wanna put them out there and see what they can do out in our, uh, out on our site that we're trying to restore. Um, but first, you know, there's things that you know I keep in mind when, um, uh, when you're using fungi, you know, and introducing it to an area is, you know, use caution, you know, with the species you're using, you don't want to, uh, use a, an invasive species or a species that's parasitic and you're going to start wiping out all your trees, you really don't want to do that. So again, it's good to go on, go on the site, see what you can find that's already growing there that you can identify that isn't pathogenic or parasitic, right? And uh, use it in that sense, right? So use, use, a, use a native species, right? And, uh, an example would be, um, you know, you, uh, using inoculated log, inoculating logs but using logs that were cut from a oak that had oak wilt, like you don't want to do that because then you'll just be introducing spores. So, you know, these are little, little things to keep in mind. So uh, we don't want to, you know, cause more harm than, than what we're trying to do, right? Then also, again, you know, the, the installations are at the mercy of nature, you know, the weather, animals, insects, uh, pathogens. So we got to devise strategies to mitigate those impacts and all, the, all those different variables. So that way it favors the fungi. Um, an example would be, um, you know, seal, sealing your logs with wax, which is a basic practice, and then mulching those logs. So that way, you know, there's no moisture loss, and uh, you know, we, we got to worry about, you know, that happening. And also, uh, the placement. You know, we got to make sure we put them in the right spot. Um, but also, before we do that, um, we want to see, you know, what's the condition of the site. You know, is it in the right stage to start introducing fungi, or is it is it too or the or is it too hot and is it just getting beat down with the sun? It's probably not a good idea. Uh, you can still try it, but you know, the, it'll be resource intensive as far as maintenance and you know, uh, human resources trying to, you know, tending to the site, water, all that good stuff. Um, so you wanna you know, keep in mind of where, uh, you know, where, where the site's at you know, in its stage of uh, restoration and uh, you know, see if uh, you know, it's right to bring fungi in. Right? And also, uh, what's, what's the restoration goal? Right? Are you trying to build soil, uh, clean soil, filter water, erosion control, uh, things like that? Uh, what's really cool is that pretty much all those things happen just by having the mycelium out there anyways. And so you do hit a lot of different uh, aspects of that. So it's really cool to use them, which is why you know, um, I'm sharing all this with you. Right? It's really cool stuff to you know, get, get the uh, fungi out there. And also, uh, you know, what species you know, will be used, again, uh, be careful not to get a pathogenic uh, species out there. And um, if you're out in the site and you're you, you're trying to find a fungi, and you're not too sure. Um, when it comes to identif identifying fungi, um, I'm kind of old school. Like um, Bill Rayner mentioned in his uh, tree ID presentation, you know, get out there with somebody uh, that knows their site, knows the area, um, get that direct experience, get a field guide, you know, camera, take some pictures. Just get that, you know, your curiosity, you know, get out there and just get directly in, in contact with them, you know, see how they're growing, see where they're growing. They, they, they're usually watching you and you just kind of don't know that they're there. And so it's always good to get out there because that's where that uh, relationship, you know, with, uh, with nature, you know, comes in. And I'm pretty sure we all do that anyways. We, we're, we're connoisseurs of nature here. So, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time out there. So um, you, you, develop, you get that fungal lens and you start to see mushrooms everywhere once you, uh, once you start to look for them. But uh, uh, again, uh, check out um, Bill Rayner's talk on tree ID, because that's, that's pretty important when it comes to identifying fungi. If you don't know what it is, um, that's, that's an indicator uh, when you're trying to key it out. 
because some some species grow on specific woods and others uh, kind of grow on anything. Um, so it, have, knowing the tree will help you identify the fungi and also it'll help you understand like what is it growing on, right? So if it's growing on an elm, you know that you can use uh, elm mulch or oak, oak mulch or something like that. You know that the mycelium will take to it a little, uh, a little bit quicker then it would be, you know, taking it from an elm and trying to grow it on, you know, say hackberry or something like that. And so it's good to know your trees, right? So you want to check that talk out. Um, and so, um, let's see, moving on to site location, you know, management. Um, this picture right here is an ideal spot, you know, riparian area is ideal, um, you know, having the shade, humidity, um, having just having that nice, you know, cool that cool temperature um, is a good a good spot. And um, in Jim's talk, you know, the art of placement, right? It's crucial to the success of the um, the installation, right? If the resources aren't there, um, the success rate diminishes, and the input, you know, you got to put a lot of input into it. So the idea is to you know make sure all the mycelium needs are met when you're you know you're, you're strategizing, you know, how to approach approach the site um, and, and you know because sometimes like the sites that need TLC don't have all this stuff right you have to wait a bit um, to start introducing that stuff there um, and so that's that's pretty uh, pretty standard you know cool place high humidity shade and then some resources meaning you know some uh, you know mulch down down trees down logs leaf litter um, they're, you know fungi love you know taking all this stuff apart and again, riparian areas are awesome. Those are the perfect spots to maybe source some fungi to use in a different area of the site. So, nope. Oh, gonna have these out here. Uh, logistics, you know, logistics and management, um, you know, they're, they're awesome. Um, again, uh, in, you know, in Jim's talk, you know, the last part of that, that strategy, you know, the planning and the logistics is, you know, how practical is it, you know, uh, people have the these big dream hopes and dreams, but uh, the on-site, you know, the the ongoing management. Um, are you going to need to, you know, water the site more than, you know, more than, uh, you know, just the natural rainfall? Um, you know, do you have the tools to, you know, bring things in, inoculate logs? Um, you know, all that the stuff that you'll need. You know, how much is it going to cost? And um, and also one of the things that you know consider is you not know, is the uh, can the materials be sourced on site? In this case, you know, if we're trying to wipe out some legustrums, well, we have resources on site, right? But how are we going to uh, inoculate them? How are we going to get the, the mycelium to that material? And there's a couple of different ways that we can do that. So there's a couple of things to keep in mind. You know, can you get to the site, right? Um, you got to hike in. You got to hike in with a big bag of mulch. I hope you're not doing that. But um, you know, it's just, you know, keep those things in mind um, when you're um, trying, you know, approaching the site and the restoration right so we want to be practical we want to stress ourselves out and stretch ourselves thin you know we want to make sure that the fungi can get established right we want to set ourselves up for success in that sense so now we'll move into the cool part uh, is the uh, inoculations uh, the different methods for intro introducing uh, fungi into a site uh, in your restoration strategy uh, first one's logs and um right now is a good time to cut logs you know it's winter um all the energy is being stored in the limbs so the sugars are really high inside of the uh, limbs and so those are good is a good time to do it um if you have a brush pickup if you get that notice go out and about and people are just cutting trees and they're just throwing this stuff out and giving it to the city that's substrate that's uh that's, those are mushroom materials so i i get excited whenever brush pickup comes around i'm always on the lookout for you know healthy looking you know logs and you know limbs and stuff like that you don't want to get stuff that's all sick you know it's uh sometimes a fungi may have already moved into it uh, but this is good you know because you can um you can inoculate them seal them up and then you can kind of just leave them in place they do take a long time to fruit um but uh the site out there uh at the volunteer center uh when i first uh, met lisa and jim they have a bunch of logs out there fruiting turkey tail and that's uh you know that's a good that's a good way to use uh, especially using invasive species, right? Because it's just uh, doing it this way as opposed, cause, uh, uh, as opposed to turning it into mulch, you know, you need a wood chipper and all that good stuff. You need, you know, 
you know, lug that thing around, you get the gas for it, you know, safety, you don't want to, the wood chippers are pretty mean machines, so you have to be careful with them. But uh, this is a pretty simple way to do it. And it's good for, um, I have my garden bed is kind of lined with a couple inoculated logs, just because, um, so you can get some mushrooms out of it. Um, growing and having a protein source there in your garden. All right, so log, log inoculation. And in the resources, um, th there's, gonna, these video, there's gonna have some videos of how to inoculate the logs. And those will be there. There's no audio for them, but uh, the, the video is there. It's, uh, there is a resource for you to learn how to inoculate some logs. Uh, broadcast method is what I call it, is just throw down some spawn and um, cover it with some mulch. And you know, this is a, it's pretty standard. Uh, it's just like mulching trees, except you're adding some mycelium into the mix. Um, hopefully they will establish itself, but if it doesn't, you know, it'll all break down. But also it'll help that mulch break down a lot faster and it'll feed the trees. Um, it'll feed, you know, if you have swells, that's a good place to do it. Um, if you're inoculating swells, uh, that stuff, you know, if it establishes itself, it'll really bolt itself to the ground and, you know, it'll start breaking down, it'll start feeding everything and maybe you'll get some fruitings. Um, so here I have, uh, you know, I got everything it needs, you know, it's got, um, it's got shade from the trees. Uh, I got some mulch for the food source and I got a water, I got a drip line, so that's good, but you can't always have a drip line on site. But uh, just keep in mind, just make sure it has the resources for what you're doing. Um, and that's a good thing, you know, around trees. Um, again, in Jim's uh, Woody Plant Talk, you know, about the juniper, thific, the juniper thickets, that's, a, that's an ideal condition because it's, you know, it's a good placement, it's cool, it's got shade, moisture, um, the soil's low built up there, and so that's good. Uh, to maybe try this method out there. And then if you get the mycelium established, um, I remember he mentioned like once you start at the, you know, the edge and you start expanding from there, you can take the mycelium um, and use your first installation as a mother patch. And then you can take parts of that and you can basically, you can expand it. You can, you can uh, transfer some of the materials into a new site and just expand that and just feed the mycelium more organic matter, right? And so you may just have to install a patch once and then from there you can keep expanding and have little satellite patches right and so that's just uh, something to keep in mind right and uh, really this this is ideal you know when you're, you're uh, you always, I mean you always want to mulch your plants in your trees but um, if the mycelium does die um, it becomes hydrophobic on top and it kind of it basically seals the seals the top of the soil and uh, I remember in a uh, Professor Hewitt's talk, uh, he's talking about the hydrologic cycle and how the, like the temperature and vegetation affect, you know, the movement of water. So you can kind of scale that down, but underneath the soil. Uh, so if the soil heats up and water starts to evaporate, it's going to hit that roof of that dead mycelium and probably just, you know, it'll just fall back down. It'll just stay in the soil longer. So it does help, you know, reduce that evaporation. So, and the, that's just typical of mulching, but you got the mycelium in there too. So that's always good. So you want to try and uh, that's a good, you know, that's pretty, a pretty standard thing. You could also use cardboard, right, and layer it just to, you know, keep those layers and, um, you know, reinforce that and reduce that evaporation rate. That's just a broadcast method. This is for inoculation. This one was really cool. And this one, I just, I was just out there and I was like, hey, this makes sense. Um, I, I was walking in the park and uh, I know there's a stump that I know that has turkey tail that lives there. And I, I know that it, it, it lives there. And then I saw that the city came by and did some, uh, some fresh cuts. And so I was like, well, you know, cultivation, spores. Uh, so I just grabbed some uh, fruit bodies and I laid them poor side down and I covered them with some leaf litter. And then I went back a year later and it did take some time, but I went back a year later and I have some, there's mycelium coming out. Turkey tail is fruiting. Um, we have some, uh, mycelium starting to emerge here on the left and on the right we had some um, some fruiting bodies popping out of some of the, the the root flare right there and so this is a I mean this one's low maintenance and say there, there's a site that you just can't get materials in to do like a big installation um, you can lug around a whole bunch of logs break off the fruit bodies and lay them down and just cover them up with car some cardboard and mulch and just let them spore late right that's a very low maintenance and I mean th this happened to work um, and there's another stump along that trail that happened to just pop up turkey tail just just because I guess um, and uh, so that's another little 
um, inoculation method that you can use that's uh, low maintenance. It does take some time, but you know, uh, nature takes its time, so you should too. This one's cool. Uh, this is a spore slurry, and you can do this with uh, any amount, any type of spores. Um, this is an odd looking uh, fungi here. Uh, this is a Pithalithus arises, and this was actually growing right outside the entrance to the volunteer station there. And when I first found it, I thought it was like a bird's egg. And I was like, no, nah, it's too soft. And so I picked it up and I cut it open and I was like, what is this thing? Um, so I did my research and it ended up being an earth ball. And it turns out it's ectomycorrhizal and it's found around oaks and pines and prickly pear. And so one thing you can do is let this thing go through its you know, life cycle and let these little sacs you know, burst and dry out. And on the edges over here on the, the far right, you can see it looks powdery those are the spores and so it's releasing its spores that way and so what you can do is you can make a spore slurry and just add it to add it to water and here I threw some hard uh, some hardwood uh, fuel pellets so just that that uh, pelletized sawdust and it'll soak up all that all of that spore mass and then you can use that as an amendment you can use it just to throw in some soil um, and I know like you don't want to add wood to soil right because it leaches nitrogen but this is covered in spores and so when you throw this into a planting hole it'll make direct contact with the roots and so that association would happen a lot quicker and then also as that mycelium as those spores germinate and the mycelium starts growing it has the sawdust to start breaking down and actually turning that into a usable food source for the plant that you're establishing it with so that's a spore slurry and you can do this with uh, you know any type of uh, mushroom spores so that's one method and this is a simple one, mycorrhizal inoculants. I'm sure some of y'all do this already, uh, but I like to plant all my seedlings and all my, um, oops, my alarm, keeping time. Uh, I like to inoculate everything that I grow with uh, mycorrhizal uh, inoculant. And um, even if it doesn't associate with it, um, I still get the spores into the soil because I do put it in my garden and odds are, you know, there's some mycorrhizal there. So if it doesn't associate with the tree or with the plant that I'm planting, then it may uh, grow and associate with, uh, it may seek out a network that's already established, right? And so it's always good just to get it out there. Um, it's fairly inexpensive and stuff. You can, you can stretch yourself out pretty good. So, um, and in, um, in the resources, the Rodale Institute has a technique for cultivating uh, mycorrhizal fungi and you know, producing spores and stuff like that. I haven't done it yet. It seems uh, pretty time, pretty, pretty intensive, but um, uh, Got the message there. <laughs> Seems pretty intensive, but uh, it's a way to get you know abundance of the uh, native mycorrhizal. So um, if you know you got some good associations there on the site, it's good to try and you know uh, maybe wash wash off the root zones, uh, uh, all the roots of some plants that are established. And you'll be washing off some spores, and then you use that to you know maybe hydrate some soil or actually pour into mulch and pour into a planting hole um, when you're putting in your other uh, uh, plants that are you're using to restore so you can get those uh, those spores out there and just spreading spores is basically what you're doing right so and oh one thing uh, I'll go back the uh, this pithalithus uh, pithalithus uh, this one um, in a uh, teeming one fungi Jeff said this one is uh, ideal for oak inoculations and so um, I remember when uh, Lisa was talking about you know do you plant uh, acorns or seedlings or saplings. Um, I think whichever route you go, my opinion, inoculate it with something, right, just to help it out. So, um, and it will help uh, regardless, right? So we always want to give the, the young plants and young trees a, 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 the upper hand in their young years because those are the most uh, most critical when they're uh, developing. So, so we move down to the mycorrhizal inoculant. This one, uh, fairly low maintenance, uh, takes a little bit of elbow grease. But this one, I just call it the split pack and cover method. Um, I split a stem with a wedge. If you don't have a wedge, you can use a chainsaw and cut some uh, cavities in there. You pack it with the sawdust bond that's, that's growing mycelium, and then you cover it up with some mulch, right? And so that's, that's one way to do it, fairly low maintenance, especially if it's, a, if it's an area that it's hard to lug in, you know, bigger equipment. You can take in a couple, uh, you know, just a hammer, or not hammer, I, I use a sledgehammer, or a hammer or a maul. Um, or a chainsaw and you know the the concept here is just you know uh, break open that stump and uh, pack pack the mycelium in there so that way it can start to take 
take this stuff apart to make use of this. So that way, the primary decomposer can start breaking it down, and then all the soil microbes could then move in because it's going to take a while for this to break down on its own. Right? So, split pack and cover method, block method. This one, we just use production blocks after uh, I get some harvest out of my mushrooms. I like to just throw them, uh, throw them in my garden or somewhere in my landscape. Here, I was using it just to slow down some water. And um, I put the cardboard paper on it just to help maintain some moisture, right? And so um, the theme here, right, is just to get it in the ground, cover it up, and make sure that it's got, it's got some adequate moisture and has some resources. It still has resources here in these blocks. Um, these are never truly spent. They're still alive, even though you get a bunch of flushes of mushrooms from them. And then um, you know, this is about two months later. I got some fruitings. I got to eat some mushrooms that I grew in my garden. And then, um, you know, and then also I left some to sporulate and let, let my little garden neighbors, you know, um, let them eat that. I like to share my, the fruits of my labor. These are fruits, right? And uh, this is another, uh, this is another garden bed. All I did, I trenched this out and I just laid it directly on the soil. I didn't care if it got contaminated or it broke or anything like that because you know, either way, this is going to break down. It's going to be food for the soil. And um, I just covered it with back with the native soil. And I threw some logs on top just to add another layer, uh, just to prevent some evaporation. And some about two months later, I had some oysters popping out. They weren't growing on the logs. They were actually growing on the, uh, out of the blocks. But that's just something there just for um, moisture retention and the spores. The spores, you know, will get on this and maybe start to germinate and grow on that. Um, but all, always we have this stuff breaking down and uh, you know feeding our soil and so those are some um, those are some installation methods so you know you know experiment with experiment with them you know work with them and see you know see which ones work for you and which ones would be best for your strategy and your site right and um, that is it for my talk right and you know some beautiful reishi mushrooms I grew outside and I like to share that one just because it's just it's just gorgeous, um, and uh, I I never I didn't I picked it, but I, I use that as a display in my classes. So maybe you'll see it in person one day. So um, these are the references, so you know that I'm not making all this up. Um, I did you know uh, did look into all these things. You know, pulled a little bit from everybody, uh, trying to get it into a, you know a little bit easier to uh, understand uh, form, and so that way we can actually apply it, use it, um, get curious, get interested. And, uh, you know, you know, thank you everybody, you know, for your time and attention. And I hope I got you excited about mycology and you start to work with fungi and learn their wisdom. And um, if you need anything, um, just you know, contact me. My, my contact information will be um, given out uh, to everybody. And also, you know, just let me know if you got any questions or you got any projects going on and, um, you know, we'll take it from there. So, you know, I look forward to working with you all and thank you very much. So. Now we're ready for some uh, ready for some questions. So. Thank you, Lewis. Um, we got some questions. Let me oh, start. Here we go. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, okay. I'm taking water. Oh, you're great. Um, so my question, um, there's a question. Oh, one was like a question of disbelief early on. Uh, wait, what? Chanterelles sporulate underground without fruiting bodies? Can you elaborate? No, they sporulate, a, they, there's mycorrhizal fungi that sporulates underground out of the mycelium. And so they sporulate underground so that way when those spores germinate, they're already underground where the roots are. And sometimes they produce fruit bodies like uh, morels, um, you get the chanterelles, and um, what's the other one, like amanita. Um, those are mycorrhizal and those produce fruit bodies above ground and they sporulate that way. Why they do that, I'm not too sure, um, but they do. Um, the amanitas aren't edible, but the chanterelles are edible, morels are edible, um, and so some some of them produce fruit bodies, some of them don't. Uh, a lot of them don't, uh, but the ones that do, um, those uh, mushrooms are you know, the edible and they're choice edible, and those they can't be cultivated, uh, as far as I know, in the lab, meaning like in the mushroom kits and stuff like that. People haven't been able to do that because they need that plant partner, and so those you do have to forage for. I hope that answers the question. Some do in underground and some above ground. Um, I can't tell you why. Um, I don't know that yet. So, 
hope that answers your question. Great. A question related to your resources. Um, Elizabeth asks, what was the book you recommended for ID? Was it in your resources slide? Uh, that one. Let's go back up. For ID, where are we at? No, actually, I didn't, I didn't have one for ID, uh, but Texas Mushrooms. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give a, I'll give you an updated uh, list, Audrey. Uh, okay. Some are coming to mind now. Um, uh, Texas Mushrooms is one. They just started reprinting that one. And then uh, Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast States. That's a new one that just came out. Okay, great. Um, and, I didn't and have the references because I, I kind of didn't reference them to, for the talk, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll, send you the, I'll send you the link for those. Okay, and what um, Lewis is talking about where we'll have the link is going to be on this Google Doc with resources and we can kind of live update that. So I just put that in the resource in the um, chat again so you can kind of bookmark that page. We'll update that with the extra resources. Cool. Um, and related to your, uh, Jim and Lisa have a question about how do you start a quote mother patch? So a mother patch is, um, is an area that you inoculate with uh, sawdust spawn, or if you ex you grow, um, if you you expand the mycelium onto say a say a big old bucket of wood chips, and you you inoculate an area, um, and you intentionally inoculate the area. And so when you make a patch, usually what you do you just lay down cardboard, you lay down uh, wood chips, you wet them, you add your sawdust spawn. And you basically just make lasagna and then you just top it off with wood chips and then you let the mycelium establish itself there and then once it's grown there for a while a good six months to a year and it's established then you can basically you can go there and you could just like dig into it and take a big chunk of it and then you can use it and inoculate a different area and so you're basically establishing one big patch and I just call it a mother patch or the main patch and then you you branch out from there Right. And so you can um, say if you have a site that you're trying to, uh, you know, introduce fungi, you can have patches and then you can basically start expanding and kind of leapfrogging in a sense, I, if you kind of get what I'm saying, um, by establishing patches in, in the ideal spots. But, you know, mother patch is the main patch that you would take mycelium from and use it to inoculate another area. And to keep the patch going, you just keep adding organic matter and just keeping it fed. Thanks for that. Um, and Dan has a question. Are um, fungi site specific? Site specific? I think uh, you've talked about, yeah, you've talked about their relationships with um, certain species of trees. Maybe, yeah, is there anything else you can talk related to like the site and, and how fungi might be specific? Um, I would say yes, because uh, sometimes you'll you'll find stuff in the really rugged areas. You actually find stuff like that uh, that pithelithus that I, I mentioned, the one that you make the spore slurry with, that one that looked like an egg. That one I found right outside the uh, the research station in that or the volunteer station, and out there it's pretty rocky, caliche. It's not. I I I have not found that one like deep in the woods where it's all wet and there's a lot of oaks and everything like that. And so there's some things that you'll find in different, uh, different habitats and different climates. Um, so it does vary. And that's where uh, getting out and learning the site, you know, um, helps because you'll, you'll see what's growing there and just wasn't, it, what doesn't grow there. Like I've been out and about in the woods in, in a couple of parks here in San Antonio, and I haven't found wild oyster mushrooms growing. I found a lot of other stuff, but I just haven't found them out there. Um, so, and also the window, to find them is really, really small. It's really short. And so it's usually the rainy seasons, um, you know, fall and, uh, fall and spring are, are a good time to go out there and take a look. Um, in the summer too, there's, there's mushrooms that pop up in the summer, but you'll just have to go out there and see what's actually growing on site. Um, you'll be surprised at what you find out there. Um, but I, you know, site specific, um, I would say yes, because I mean, it's kind of random um, and it's, it's always, you know, I go back to the same places and I find new fungi and it's, it's just always a, it's always a, you know, adventure in that sense. Um, but as far as site specific, say if you, you're really, you know, set on using a certain fungi for that site, um, you know, preferably use, you know, use a native fungi that you find there. 
and uh, the field guide will help you also and also just learning again uh, digging into the other resources you know where to find them uh, what times of the year to find them what they actually grow on um, some you'll find actually growing on stumps most of the time as opposed to growing on living trees uh, things like that so okay Welcome. great and um with someone or were you were you saying something else did i cut you off no i was, I was I have to answer the question okay great. Site specific. um so we have another question and just to preface this question as a public program we can't recommend purchases from specific businesses um, and this question is about where to purchase uh, spores. So where can you purchase without, if you can, you know, kind of answer this question without directing us to a certain provider, can you speak to where you can purchase uh, reliable native spores or mycelium? Uh, like what native, you should to, to look for that. Um, well, I'd say you're in the right spot, but um, uh, there's, um, there's different, the, the vendors, like the big vendors that you can uh, get them from, uh, just, you know, if you Google, you know, mushroom spores, um, be careful, you're going to come across, you know, psychoactive spores, everyone's always trying to push those. But um, usually like the spores of uh, like certain species, it's, it's kind of hard to come by like uh, oyster spores and reishi spores. Um, not very many people sell them. Um, more so they sell the liquid mycelium, which is, I, which I, uh, rec I recommend more than spores because it's, you can never take a, a completely clean spore print but you can get a nice clean culture of mycelium and the mycelium when you use it to inoculate um, you know grains or sawdust it'll take to that a lot faster and it'll colonize a lot faster so I, I recommend uh, looking for liquid cultures if anything and that's the liquid mycelium it's grown it's live mycelium tissue growing in a liquid medium it's basically a sugar water um, I would I would prefer, I would recommend looking at that but um, just, you know, you'd have to search online because, again, the spores, um, they're kind of hard to come by. Not really many people sell them just because uh, the contamination rates are a lot higher if you um, try and buy spore syringes, uh, spore prints. Um, you'll just have to uh, source them out. Uh, I know people sell them like on Etsy and I mean, you can buy them on Amazon, but I mean, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't look for spores really. I actually just take spore prints myself off. The stuff that I grow, um, and so um, yeah, if you if you can, you know, learn 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 the cultivation skills so that way you can take your own spore prints, and uh, you know you'll have, you know, native native stuff like that. And so, but again, um, you're in the right place for uh, native fungi. Just saying, you know, without saying. No. Thanks. And also, Gary has a. I think this is maybe a similar question, and maybe you already answered it. But are there easily available sources of mycorrhizal inoculants? Is that related to the liquid? Um, uh, no, you can that you can get at pretty much any nursery. They'll usually carry uh, uh, an inoculant. Um, there's a Texas company um, that that sells it, and pretty much yeah, just go to the nursery and say, hey, you got mycorrhizal inoculant. Um, they usually carry it. It's just like in a powder. It's a powder form that you can. Um, you know, you can mix in water, or like you saw on the slide, I just kind of dust it into the planting hole. But yeah, my, uh, you can buy mycorrhizal inoculant. That's pretty common, so that shouldn't be hard to find at all. Great. And then, um, is there a, a difference between molds? So this person's thinking of black mold, for example, and the fungi that have fruiting bodies. Um, they molds have they have fruiting structures as well. They're not uh, fruiting bodies. Well, they're, I'd say that, you know, they're fruiting structures. Um, they're not as big and as beautiful, but if you look at them under the microscope, you know, they look like little, um, I don't know if you've seen the Lorax, how the trees are, they look like little lollipops. A lot of them look like that. Um, the little uh, ascus and th that, that little, um, that little um, looks like a little bulb at the end of a stick, you know, um, they're like bread molds and stuff like that. Um, that the spores are inside those sacs, and so that's how they disperse their spores, you know, like black mold, green mold, uh, like trichoderma, and stuff like that. Um, so mold is is a fungi, but it's it's in a different class of fungi. Um, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head which which class that is. Um, sorry, or phylum. I have to sharp right now. <laughs> but I uh, they have fruiting structures. It's just not big, beautiful fruiting bodies. And 
to eat. Please don't eat mold. Right. Um, so, um, oh, just a quick, this is kind of a yes or no question. Um, Mike wants to know if you're involved with the Blend Creek Greenbelt Fungus Project. Um, I am not. This is the first time okay. I've All right. Well, there's, yeah, it's a city park um, or preserve uh, that is, um, there's a lot of invasive lacustrine management there, but that's like a whole nother webinar. Um, so Ranley it has a question, what happens to the mushrooms in the heat of summer? In the heat of summer, um, they use, if they don't get consumed, they just dry out and they'll just become just, they'll just become hard. They'll take a long time to break down. Once they dry out, they're, they're actually really, really tough. Um, but eventually they'll, they'll break down, they'll get, they'll get chewed up and eaten up by all the little insects and maybe some foraging animals. But uh, in the summer, uh, cause you can find like the chanterelles, those actually grow in the summer, which, you know, which is odd. Um, so a hot summer rain, like they, they'll actually fruit. And so you got to pick them. Um, if, if anything, uh, you got to get to them quick. So right after a rain, get out there because, you know, it's real on the streets, like the bugs and everybody, they're going to lay their larvae in there. So if, when you get, when you pick fresh mushrooms, cut them open, there's probably some larva in there, right? And so they'll either get consumed before they dry out or uh, depending on the species, some of them, they'll, um, it's called deliquescence they'll just basically digest themselves. Um, I, I think you probably, uh, pretty uh, sure everyone's been seen uh, after a rain, you see the mushrooms, they pop up and then they liquefy and they look like ink. That's what uh, deliquescence is. They just, that's how they spread their spores, uh, which is really interesting. And so in the summer, they either dry out, get eaten, or uh, yeah, they sporulate and they just, they're just there and they just, uh, they, they break down eventually, so. Rishi's growing them in the summer too, so I'm just keep that in mind. Great. So what kind of mulch do you like in general do you recommend for growing mushrooms in Texas home landscaping? Um, I like to uh, I like to like uh, part because I, I have a friend as an arborist. I like to just grab what they have. Um, sometimes a little tricky though because you know you got a mix of different wood types and stuff like that. Um, if anything, oak is probably like the best mulch. Um, you know, I know if you go to the stores, uh, the mulches, uh, it, it, you, you probably wouldn't want to, um, use, uh, uh, like cedar mulch, uh, anything like that, uh, because those, uh, those are kind of anti, they have, uh, kind of antifungal, uh, properties. So it's going to, it'd be kind of hard for the, the, the mycelium to leap off and to start to break that down. Uh, that's why you don't see very many mushrooms growing on, like on cedar and, uh, juniper and stuff like that. There's some really tough ones that eventually do, but um, if anything, uh, try and get some mulch from um, from an arborist, um, and just kind of stay away from the uh, you know the uh, aromatic woods. I recommend anything but the aromatic woods just to be good. So. Great. Uh, okay, so can you over inoculate an area? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> High inoculation rates are good because you have a better chance of establishment uh, as opposed to spreading stuff thin. Um, because if you spread your spawn or your inoculant too thin, it's got to it's got to base it's got to fuse back together. So if you do high inoculation rates, you're probably going to have a better uh, uh, success rate of establishment. And so over inoculating, I'd say if anything, the over inoculation will come in as far as a cost perspective, like if you're buying a lot of inoculate that you may not have needed, if anything, but I, I don't think you can over inoculate an area. Uh, it, it's in my opinion though. So a little bit goes a long way. So um, I keep that in mind. Great. Well, we're Brad, we got a couple more minutes, but a couple more questions. Um, Brad asks, do you add rock material, like local rock material to the substrate when using fungi for restoring native soils? Um, I, I haven't done that. Um, you can't, I mean, you can, uh, depending on what's already in the soil, um, uh, adding rocks, I don't know about, I mean, ox, rocks, are, you know, they, they're good for drainage or whatnot. Um, if you're talking about like, um, what was it? Like azomite, like rock dust and stuff like that, that's, that's good. It's, it's a super, it's a uh, big spectrum of uh, trace minerals. So that would help uh, the mycelium grow. 
but I haven't um, intentionally put rocks into um, you know the soil as far as planting goes because usually there's some type of rocks in there already um, but I haven't um, intentionally put rocks into the mix or anything like that um, and so that's something to you know to experiment with um, you know so try, try it out and see um, you know do some do some little uh, mini tests and see if you know when when plant grows a little bit better maybe it's sourcing the uh, the minerals and mineralizing the rock you know the mycelium may be doing that and maybe do some tests and uh, compare it but uh, i haven't you know I haven't, I haven't done that myself intentionally done that i just kind of if there's rocks in the soil i just leave them there you know as far as drainage and that that mineral leaching off um because those uh fungi uh, if they don't actually attach to the rock and break it down uh, some of their exudates and stuff like that in the soil can weather it, right? And al they alter the, they do alter the pH in the soil a little bit. And so that may, you know, release some of those, uh, you know, some of those minerals. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, great. Well, that is all the time we have. So Lewis, thank you so much for um, just sharing your wealth of knowledge about mycology and using it for restoration. Um, we really appreciate it, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it.